Yeah, let me open my throat. Ah, yeah. I don't need to talk like that in the podcast. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome to my podcast. Um, the name is Design and Lock because I want to share some design knowledge, but also I want to input like some personal life insight into this podcast as well. Uh, just, you know, share some personal stories, not necessarily relevant to design, but I think something, you know, something I think fun. For you don't know me, uh, probably nobody knows me because this is my first episode. Um, I am a product and service designer based in Helsinki, Finland. I came to Finland three years ago in 2020 for my master's study. Uh, I just finished my whole master's study. Yeah, you know, I turned in my thesis. I requested for graduation and that was it. Yeah, uh, everything is done. So now I'm, you know, in this very sad winter in Helsinki. Got basically nothing to do in the daytime because I'm super running low on budget. It doesn't make much sense for me to go out. And also, like, the, basically there's nothing to do uh, because it's just so boring. I was like, why not just grab a mic if I don't have, a, like, a professional microphone i was like whatever the iphone microphone is quite decent so i would just give it a go so yeah here i am and yeah you know speaking of graduation whenever i told someone that oh i graduated uh, just now and they went like oh congratulations i was like ah oh, please don't congrats me for like losing all the student benefit like you know the excitement of getting graduated lasts for like I don't know, last for like five minutes for me. I don't know. It's just like something I deserve, I guess, because I work hard. I, I, I finish all the credit. So that's something I deserve to, to get. So it's like a spontaneous process. It's not like, wow, something really big and like a big surprise of your life. It's just like you reach that point and yeah, you just did it. So I don't have much excitement, but at the moment I realized I'm losing all my student benefits. That was actually the worst. The excitement was very very soon overwritten by all this disappointment or like even anger of losing all the goodies i have in helsinki because the well-being here for students is super super nice i'm losing them all at the end of this month so yeah that's my life i'm very sad at the moment because i don't have a job so yeah everything is about the money the incentive for making a podcast is actually not that simple. Like, first of all, I have my personal interest of content creation. I was doing like YouTube, like, you know, this kind of vlogging or like video making thing like three years ago. I stopped when I started my master degree. Like I didn't really stop, but like, you know, it's just like I had way less time to, you know, make something because I think video making is very like, you need to dedicate a lot of time. So I just stopped and now I wanted to get back to like content creation. So uh, I decided decided to do podcast because apparently now like I am a huge fan of it. I listen to podcasts a lot. I consume a lot of podcasts, like both in Chinese and English. And then the second reason is that uh, I would like to share design knowledge. I'm not saying that I have the most design knowledge. Apparently, I'm just a, such a noob and um, beginner in my career. But also I think uh, whenever I learn something new, it actually helps me to digest with sharing with people. So I think podcast might be a very nice channel for me to do that. Also, I think my language ability is now capable for me to actually conduct a podcast. You know, this is the only thing maybe that I can actually show off after two years of study. Of course, I'm joking here, but you know, like three years ago, I came here, I couldn't get a job here, but now still I can't. So basically I cannot prove how much better I got uh, regarding my design skills. But you know, like English, at least uh, three years ago, my English was not very understandable. But right now, right here, I guess, if you listen until this point, it, it means that my English is understandable at least, right? You, you can get what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I just want to give it a try and see how does it go. So this episode, my topic is about my master degree. I would like to talk about the structure of the program first. So I came to Finland for this university called Auto University. Uh, I think it's actually got a very good reputation around the world, at least in Europe, I think. And the QS ranking is also super, super high, but that doesn't matter. Like. It mattered before I came here when I made the choice. Like they ranked super, super high. Let me just 
go to Finland. And also considering the living expense in Finland is actually quite affordable for me back then. So here I came. The program is called Collaborative and Industrial Design. It belongs to the Department of Design in this school. Uh, this school is like a comprehensive school, but yeah, it's kind of unfamous for its design and art education. So my program collaborative and industrial design. You can see there are like two important terms. One is collaborative and one is industrial. So we've got like one main path, which is service and digital design. And the other path is like industrial design. I had a background in industrial design, but actually given the fact that like it's super hard to land a job in Finland and probably in general around the world to find a job as an industrial designer. And also I thought just like I came to somewhere new, why not just learn something new as well? So I went for the service design path and I think I got a lot of interesting stuff out of it. I'm extremely happy with the outcome actually. Speaking of the courses I did, um, there were like a few courses I want to mention. Uh, so there were like two courses in the service design part. They are called designing for services and design for government. They were like in a very similar structure, but just one is a bit longer than the other one. So you've got like better pace in the whole course. But I took both because I don't think I'm a very, very fast learner in English. It's getting better, but then back to a year ago when I was in school, I don't feel like I was the best in learning English. So I took both of them and I think that was a very smart decision because it actually helped me to digest a bit more and then relearn, restudy on some like methodology I didn't really, you know, get into my mind. So speaking of how the courses are conducted, like they were in similar structure where you take both uh, like lectures and also do a project with groups and for a specific client. I did the project for like really, really big names. In my opinion, in the design for government, we work for the Department of Interior in Finland. And then in the other one I did for the city of Espoo, which is a city right next to Helsinki, it's also in the capital region. And it's where the school is located. I really enjoyed this kind of way of teaching. So you took lectures and at the same time you do like project. And also at the same time, teacher gives you feedback. It's like very spontaneous. And also, you know, like you learn something and you digest and kind of apply them into the project. You know, maybe not everything can be that like, you know, perfectly mapped into the project. But still, I think it's like definitely one of the best way of like, you know, learn design methodologies. And then there was another course called product development project. This course cost like nine months. So like a whole school year. I, I believe we started in September and we finished in May the next year. Like students are required to build a whole product, like a physical product. At least that's what we did. And everything from scratch to the final, final product. So we built this IoT devices for like fishing gears. And we literally started with nothing. And then in the end, actually functioning devices that can even go underwater. So that was a really great experience. Like I was working in such a multidisciplinary group. There were students from engineering background. There were students from business background, from programming background. So it was like a very, very interesting process. I didn't even get to do a lot of things um, because I was a, you know, designer who knows nothing about building a product. And also personally, I don't know how to code. Like, of course I know how to make product. I only know how to build them in a pretty way, but then for functioning way, I actually have no idea. So I was more like there observing and then, you know, designing the app and also, you know, designing the slides, like every month we got to present to the client. So I was the only one like, you know, getting down all the visual designs of the presentation. And also like that, that was actually challenging, you know, like there were so many technical stuff that you need to convert from like engineer's mouse into like a visually understandable way. So it wasn't that easy in the end. Great stuff, great stuff. I really enjoyed the study there. And of course there are courses that are not that satisfying, but I think in general, the education is very decent. I didn't regret paying for that amount of tuition fee, you know? So after the courses, you know, I think master thesis is a very big thing. So my topic is about applying co-design approaches to the creation of code of conduct. It's a very interesting topic and I 
enjoyed so much. I had so much fun in the whole process. In the end, the outcome wasn't like a work of perfection. So it's got to be in more iterations and stuff like that. I'm not even sure is my client going to do that. But yeah, anyway, it's very, very interesting because I never knew that like actually it's applicable that like co-design can also help with this kind of intangible like code of conduct. It's just like, you know, literal stuff, like a bit intangible. But in the end, you know, you find the connections and then it, they, they are actually like working together. I was really happy that I got like new insights, at least from a designer's perspective. But also I think the most valuable thing in the process is that I got a chance to do a lot of tasks that I couldn't do or like not I couldn't do, but you know, in the previous group project uh, in school, I wasn't always the best one speaking English. So there were like tasks like, you know, conducting interviews, facilitating workshops, those are the things I just didn't volunteer to do so but actually in this person of did this work you gotta do everything by yourself so I did everything and I think I conducted 99% of them very well so I'm happy and now I'm more confident doing things like that so it's overall a very good really enjoyable journey and then I want to talk about what I got out of the education you know the master degree uh, I had my bachelor in industrial design so the ability of seeing bigger picture was actually lacking out of that education. So one thing I was hoping for service design is that I could have built a ability to see bigger picture. But then in the end, I think I really do have this kind of ability. Like every time I can now think about blueprint, I can do system thinking. I can actually, whenever I see like one part of a design encounters, I can always, you know, think a bit like broader in a bigger picture. And then, you know, they're always newer and very great insights when you kind of zoom out a bit. It's just different. And then new design approaches, also a lot of interesting stuff. I'm not super sure, uh, was it because I was studying service design, something new or like because the education system is super advanced. So the new method come out of being advanced, but it doesn't matter. Just like new design approaches. And then I try to apply them into different types of design and they actually works like, especially those research methods. And also I think like practically speaking, I got more like digital and service design project in my portfolio. And the most important thing I think is actually the networking and some very limited work experience here. It's more like an entry slash ticket to Europe for me to live here longer because at least you have something in Europe. You're not here like a plain paper. So yeah, I think it's great. And then I don't really regret taking this master program. But there was one thing I really regret is like I should have stayed in Wuhan or just in China for a few more years before I start my master. I could learn something. I could like learn something from the industry. And then, you know, I would figure out what I need more, you know, like because in my master, I think I chose course uh, from a very general perspective. Like I didn't, I was like, oh, this course looks fun. Let me take it. But then actually, I think if I could have worked in the industry for a few more years, I could have a clearer mind, like, okay, what kind of courses I want to do, but doesn't matter. I think maybe I was lucky or maybe it's just like I was smart. So, uh, <laughs> I, I think I got a lot of great stuff. So in general, I don't really regret. And then um, there was a very interesting questions I got to ask in a previous interview. I went to a initial discussion in the company a few days ago and the interviewer uh, went like, oh, you've been studying in the Eastern world, in the Western world. Did you find anything different? I was like, indeed, indeed. So my education experience is like, I did my bachelor in Wuhan, but then I actually did a exchange in Taiwan. And apart from that, I did a design camp in Chiba University in Japan as well. I think I got involved in, you know, even diverse education system in Eastern Asia. After I came to the Western world, things are even more different, I would say. I don't think I can say that I have already experienced enough for the West and East because, you know, I have only been to like several schools, but I think maybe they are partially true, even I'm seeing it from a superficial or like just say personal perspective. But basically the Western world is like asking students more to, you know, think and research and, you know, be more strategic or like be more reasoning when you get things started. But then, but in East Asia, we are more focusing on this kind of, you know, practical skills. Just, you know, make things happen in the end. That gap ironically reflects the reality of like the world. Because, you know, like it's got this kind of structure of like, you know, the Western world thing. And then, you know, they 
think big, they think advancedly, and then they just have a lot of ideas. And then, you know, they send ideas to Asia and get it productive, uh, you know, manufactured. It's kind of like that, but I, I think things are changing, but still it's kind of, and if you don't believe me, I can name a even smaller differences. For example, when I was watching a master's thesis presentation back to one or two years ago in Auto, I saw this industrial design project the rendering was even worse than what I could do in the second year of bachelor. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's like bad, but just like different focus. And I think it's partially true. But also if you just want to have the scope in Eastern Asia, like when I was in mainland China, I think my school education is more focusing on like making beautiful renderings and also like converting small business ideas into like design phase. We've got so many manufacturers, like designer probably don't need to have to know like how to actually make design happen because like the manufacturers, the factories are so fast. So they can easily catch you up so when you have ideas when you convert it into like design they can already start manufacturing and things just happen fast but then in taiwan i went to the national taiwan university of technology and science it's kind of regarded as one of the best institutions for design education and then they've got like a very very traditional industrial design training i remember there was a course called like modeling, they have this like physical modeling course. Students are asked to make a model physical prototype by their hand within the nuances of like two millimeters. Like that was just insane for me to know like, wow, just human hands, how can you be that accurate? I would say a bit old school, but traditional way of doing it just kind of reflects how design industry functions in the society as well. It's just different. I don't know which one is better. The better is like more comprehensive, like everybody knows a bit of everything as a student, but yeah, maybe studying abroad is kind of a nice way of doing so. And yet that's about it for this episode. And then later on, this is going to be the log part. Like I, I want to have some personal stuff here. Uh, actually in my spare time, I listen to comedy show a lot, like especially this kind of stand up comedy. It's just like so much fun to listen to those kind of things. And I really enjoy jokes just in general in my life. So I also want to write some jokes. So maybe one day I can be, you know, stand up comedian, but well, I mean, probably I need to practice my English for like a few more decades, who knows? But yeah, I'm gonna write at least one joke in each episode, which is also relevant to the topic we are talking about in the episode. Um, so this time I just wrote this one. You guys can tell me how, how funny is it? So living in Finland, I feel there has been like Asian fever. You know, this country got no Adidas shop, like no Nike shop, no Samsung, no Apple. Like there's no shop for no brand. There is only like shop for H&M, but you know, this is like a Nordic fashion brand. So they should have something like that. But you know, like the Asian stuff, there's nothing, but they've got like a Muji flagship store, which occupies the whole floor of a shopping mall in the city center. And it's got like restaurant and also museum in that Muji shop. It's just insane. But I'm not saying that everybody is like that into Asian stuff, but you know, like it's kind of like hotter fever <laughs> here. So I just wonder like why there's Asian fever to women, men and non-binary people. But come on guys, why there's no Asian fever to Asian job seekers? How is it? <laughs> but, but really like we Asians are so hardworking. Like, come on, like you give one paycheck, we work 1.5 workload. No, no, that's not true. Like I, I, I'm not gonna do it. I, no, nobody should do that. Like you, you just should follow like how many hours you were given for your payment. So nah, keep that in mind. <laughs> But yeah, was that joke good or not? Like, let me know. And yeah, see you in the next episode. Cheers.